Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for coming out today. So I want to introduce our grand round speaker for today, uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Valeni from, uh, uh, so let me just give you a little bit of background. So I've known Anne-Marie for now about 15 years since she was a cardiology fellow. We were both 15 years old at the time. So um, Anne-Marie uh, now is associate professor of medicine and pediatrics at Harvard Medical School. Uh, she's also the interim chief of the Division of Adult Congenital Heart Disease at Boston Children's. Uh, and she's the senior fellowship director for the Adult Congenital Heart Program uh, there as well. Uh, Anne-Marie was a, a native New Englander, I guess. Uh, she went to undergrad in Boston, at Boston College uh, and did her uh, medical school at the University of Vermont and then decided to move southward to, to uh, North Carolina to Duke where she did her pediatric residency, internal medicine residency, pediatric cardiology fellowship, and adult cardiology fellowship. So she did quite a few years of training and uh, then fortunately decided to go back up to Boston. Uh, I guess she couldn't resist uh, the cold, cold weather. So, you know, in her career, she's done a tremendous job. She's uh, an imager, she does cardiac MRI, but she's a phenomenal clinician as well. Uh, and she actually heads up the women uh, in heart disease clinic there um, in pregnancy. So uh, I think she has a very unique uh, niche, has, has tremendous clinical insights. Uh, and in fact, she also recently uh, got done chairing the American Society of ECHO uh, Multimodality Imaging Guidelines for imaging of patients with Tetralogy of Fallot. So I think what Anne-Marie is going to talk to us today about is long-term outcomes uh, in adults with congenital heart disease. And since we got her here all the way from Boston, we thought we'd put her to work. And so we've also got her doing a, a noon conference for the fellows where she's going to really do just kind of a nuts and bolts of what do you do when you do congenital heart imaging. So Anne-Marie, we're very glad to have you here. And let's give a big round of applause. Thank you, Deepin. Thank you, Dr. Zogby. And thank you all for being here. I'm excited to visit. I do not have any disclosures. So over the next 45 minutes or so, I'd like to focus on three objectives. The first is to recognize the growing population of adults living with congenital heart disease. And in doing that, we're gonna discuss some of the long-term outcomes in these patients. And then I'd like to spend the majority of the time emphasizing cardiac outcomes in three specific patient populations that I think you will see as you practice. And to do this, I'd like to start with the story of one of my patients. He has given me permission to share his story with you. Jimmy, when I met him, was 48 years old in 2007, and he was a great success. He had been born with Tetralogy of Fallot in a small town in New England, and at the age of seven had undergone a repair. He spent three weeks in the hospital at that time, and you can see this photo here when he's with his parents uh, leaving the hospital after open heart surgery. And he did phenomenal. In fact, for the next 40 years, he didn't think much about it. He went to school, got married, ran a business, and it wasn't until recently that he started to feel poorly and he presented to the adult congenital heart clinic with atrial flutter and heart failure. So I'm gonna use his story to emphasize some of the points today about caring for adults with congenital heart disease. And we need to do this. When you look at the epidemiology, you can see how fast a field it's growing. So it's estimated now there's at least 2.3 million adults living with congenital heart disease in the United States alone. And that accounts for about 20,000 new patients each year, which is a 5% increase per year. And when you think about what types of disease they're living with, here's a nice breakdown. You can see in this pie graph that about half of the patients live with what are classified as more simple forms of heart disease. That is, they were born with a septal defect or valvular disease. They may or may not have had an operation. But the other half of the pie are moderate to complex lesions. And these are the ones that we see in practice, and I'm gonna focus on several of these today, which are highlighted here. Now, when you care for adults with congenital heart disease, there's a few critical things to remember. And the first is that we really can't use the traditional New York Heart Association class because everybody thinks they feel well. They grew up with heart disease. They may have chosen different activities that don't limit them. And this graphic is showing you some data from over 300 patients at the Royal Brompton Hospital who all thought they were New York Heart Association class one. But when they underwent objective exercise testing, you can see the large splay in VO2 here. 
In fact, when you compare these patients to age-matched controls without congenital heart disease, their VO2 was about half of what was expected. That is 22 versus 45 milliliters per kilogram per minute. And why is that important? Well, it's important because in our patient population, we know that a depressed oxygen consumption predicts outcome. You can see in this graphic, again from the Brompton, this group of patients which have the lowest VO2, that is less than 15 milliliters per kilogram per minute, they had very poor freedom from either hospitalization or death. Now, when we think about the worst outcome in our patients, that is death, there is some pretty recent registry data in the Netherlands, they're able to catalog all patients with congenital heart disease as adults, and this is called the CONCOR registry. This data involves almost 7,000 adults with congenital heart disease. And when they looked, they saw that there was 197 deaths in this population, and the median age of death was 48 years old. Now look at the causes of death. More than a quarter of them were from heart failure-related complications. Not surprisingly, sudden death was present other cardiac issues and vascular issues, but there was about 25% incidence of non-cardiovascular causes, just highlighting the multi-system disorders that take place in our patients and the increasing age of our patients. So when you think about long-term complications, you can think about all of these things. And this was a beautiful article just written by the team here, and we're gonna focus on several of these complications today as we talk about patients specifically. So the way we think about it is that when you see an adult with congenital heart disease, you really have to consider it a chronic disease. And you have to remember that they have a lot of subclinical organ dysfunction and their comorbidities are higher than age match controls. This is just verifying that data. This is a large registry from the United Kingdom where they looked at almost 10,000 adults with congenital heart disease in this column here, and then almost 30,000 patients without congenital heart disease. And you can see that the odds ratios for cardiac complications such as heart failure, atrial arrhythmias, and hypertension are definitely higher. But not surprisingly, as well as we've learned, the non-cardiac complications are also very prominent in this population. And I want to spend a few minutes and talk about this. So thinking about cardiac complications, we focus a lot on the anatomy and physiology in these congenital heart patients when they come in. But what about atherosclerotic heart disease? This is some recent data from Stanford looking at 178 patients with congenital heart disease. Their median age was 37. And what Dr. Louie and his colleagues found, they used three validated risk scores to do this, was that 70% of these adults had at least one modifiable risk factor. And that is many of them were overweight or obese, others had hypertension. And when you checked laboratory values, and this wasn't always done, 30% had abnormal hemoglobin A1C, lipid profiles, or C-reactive proteins. This, this came out to a 36% median estimated lifetime risk of developing atherosclerotic heart disease. So as congenital heart specialists, we actually have to think about these modifiable risk factors in our patients. Now you can go through organ by organ, system by system, and in every one, I can show you data that will say congenital heart patients run into problems. This is a very good study, over 1,100 patients with congenital heart disease, adults, and the group at the Royal Brompton looked at their GFR. And you can see the wide range in GFR here, but one out of 11 patients had moderate or severely reduced GFR, that is less than 60. And why is that important? Well, on this corresponding Kaplan-Meier curve, you can see that it was that group that had the highest cumulative mortality, three times as high for patients that do not have renal dysfunction. We are also learning more and more about the hepatic dysfunction that takes place in our patients. This has been highlighted in the most complex group of patients, those that have what's called single ventricle Fontan physiology where when you're born, you don't have two ventricles that can support the circulation, so you go through a series of operations in order to get the passive blood flow to the lungs. And what that results in is chronically elevated central venous pressures contributing to this. Here, you can see on this histologic stain, very dense fibrosis and sinusoids that are dilated. And what we have found is this is a real contributor to morbidities and mortality in our adult congenital heart patients, specifically the Fontan patients, but it, you can extrapolate that to other populations. And when we think down the road about referring patients for transplant, we have to think about comorbidities like this. Would they be an isolated heart transplant or do they need to be considered for heart liver? 
makes it much more complicated discussion. There are a myriad of pulmonary abnormalities that exist in our patients. This x-ray is just showing you one of my adults who had surgery when she was very young and she has an elevated uh, hemidiaphragm from phrenic nerve injury. That, that happens quite a bit. You can also see lung perfusion abnormalities. Some of these patients have real problems with branch pulmonary artery stenoses. There have been small studies looking at specific respiratory complications like obstructive sleep apnea, probably under-recognized in adult congenital heart patients, but at least a 20% incidence of that. Restrictive lung disease, this is very common, particularly in those patients that have had thoracotomies when they were little. And then there are other anatomic malformations they can be born with involving their airway, their, their jaw, enlarged cardiac structures, all of which contribute to lung disorders. And then we have a special group of adult congenital patients that suffer from pulmonary vascular disease. And I wanted to take a minute to talk about this because I think it's very important to recognize that if you're an adult with congenital heart disease, you can have pulmonary hypertension from a number of pathways. This is an, a nice classification system that I like that separates the pulmonary hypertension into four classes. That is, you can have pulmonary hypertension because you've had it since you've had your operation. You can have it coincidentally, meaning you had an operation for congenital heart disease, but that defect alone shouldn't have caused the pulmonary vascular changes that actually exist. Maybe you're an adult who lives with a persistent left to right shunt and has some degree of, sci uh, some degree of elevated resistance, but not true Eisenmangers. And the hardest group of patients to take care of those with Eisenmanger syndrome, where they have severe elevations in their pulmonary vascular resistance. No matter which classification you fall into, if you're an adult with congenital heart disease and you have pulmonary hypertension, you have higher rate of death, hospitalization, and resource utilization compared to adults with congenital heart disease who do not have elevated pulmonary vascular resistance. And an area that we know very little about is vascular disease and endothelial function in our patients. Now we know, again, in those complex patients, those Fontan patients, there have been small studies that show us that patients have impaired endothelial function. They have reduced blood flow to their lower extremity muscles, and they also have reduced venous capacitance. Now these studies are 10, 20 patients at most. But when you look at adults with congenital heart disease, you know that there's issues. This picture is actually Jimmy's legs at age 50. Look at the chronic venous disease that he has, and we need to start recognizing that this exists and thinking about ways to better understand the link between the peripheral vasculature and the central vasculature in our patients. This is a wide open area for research. And as we go through system by system, we can't forget about the importance of the neurodevelopmental and psychosocial outcomes that exist in our patients. Many of our patients have been through a lot as children and they have behavioral and developmental, and some of them have neurologic abnormalities. In fact, this is much higher if they have a, do a documented genetic syndrome. One study showed that 50% of adults with congenital heart disease meet diagnostic criteria for a psychiatric diagnosis, uh, mood disorder, anxiety disorders, mm -hmm. and these factors are present in all groups, and that's an important point. These are not just the patients that have had six or seven surgeries or the most complex disease. You could be listed as mild heart disease and still suffer from psychiatric issues. So there are AHA guideline recommendations that we should be thinking about referral for vocational counseling, for educational counseling in our patients. And frighteningly, we are starting to recognize that malignancy is more common in adults that have grown up with congenital heart disease. This is some recent data from the Quebec database. They are another place where they're able to catalog all the congenital heart patients. So they found over 34,000 adults with congenital heart disease and compared them to the general population in Canada. And you can see on this graphic, the patients that have congenital heart disease are in the boxes, and they definitely have a higher prevalence of having a malignancy. In fact, it's about two times as high, and it occurs in both men and women. Most common cancers in our patients seem to be breast, colon, and prostate cancer. And that is why now the pediatric cardiologists are being much more cognizant of how much exposure children have to radiation, thinking about the fact that when they're adults, they may be more prone to develop malignancies. So a lot of general comorbidities here. Now I'd like to switch gears and just focus on three groups of patients that I think you will see in practice and talk about some of their outcomes. And I'm gonna go back and start with Jimmy. So Jimmy had tetral has Tetralogy of Fallot. 
So when you see adults with congenital heart disease, one of the key things to remember is you have to think about the surgical era that existed when they were operated on. He was operated on in the 1960s. There has been a staged management to repair so that older adults may have had palliative shunts, such as shown here, where there's a Blalock Tossig shunt to provide increased blood flow to the lungs. And this was pioneered by Helen Tossig, Alfred Blalock, Vivian Thomas. And then they let children grow for a while and came back for a complete repair. Those complete repairs were first done by Dr. Lillehei, University of Minnesota, and involved, as you can see in this illustration, patching the ventricular septal defect and opening up the area of obstruction, that is taking out all of the pulmonary stenosis. This figure is showing you what's called a transannular patch. That is, the surgeon has cut away the pulmonary valve as he's cut away the obstruction, and what that results in is free pulmonary regurgitation. This is our largest group of ACHD patients currently that we take care of, adults with tetralogy. So how do they do? Well, there are some historic studies. This was a very well-quoted study out of Germany, single center study of almost 500 patients and looking at the long-term survival. And children do terrific. Once they have tetralogy repair, they usually go up, grow up, go to school, play with their peers, and are not limited. But something happens. Look at the change in the slope of the survival curve around 25 years post-operatively. Something happens when they're adults that puts them more at risk for doing poorly. One of the areas that I'm particularly in is thinking about how people die. So you can see the mode of death has really changed over time. There was an original study out of Mayo Clinic showing that almost half of the patients with tetralogy died of a sudden death. But you can see over time, this is a study I just mentioned from Germany or more recent data, that is becoming less of a factor, whereas heart failure has sustained as a great factor in death. And now the other causes are becoming more apparent. That is the non-cardiovascular causes of death that as people age, they succumb from. So let's think about Jimmy. The guideline recommendations is that cardiac MRI should be used in the evaluation of tetralogy patients. So when we met him in 2007, that's what we chose to do. And here's his initial MRI. These are short axis images. I'm starting up at the base of the heart here, going down to the apex. You can see the left ventricle here, the right ventricle here. And notice this very dyskinetic area of the anterior free wall, a very dilated, dysfunctional right ventricle. I've put the quantitative numbers down here below. The right ventricle is twice the size of normal. The index to end diastolic volume is 192 milliliters per meter squared. The ejection fraction of the right ventricle is reduced at 36%. But don't forget about the left ventricle. Look at its motion there. And actually, the left ventricle has mild dysfunction as well with an ejection fraction of 50%. So we go on and look at some more pictures. In our patients with tetralogy, we do specific right ventricular outflow tract views here. You can see there really is no remnant of a pulmonary valve. So what we're able to do is isolate that area where we think the pulmonary valve should be and actually do what's called phase contrast imaging. And you can see the red flow here is going out into the PA. The blue flow is going back into the right ventricle. And by doing this, we can actually quantify the amount of pulmonary regurgitation, which is here, or in him, 48%. So as we care for Jimmy, we have to remember a basic tenet of taking care of adults with congenital heart disease, and that is the current surgical strategies that we see every day in congenital heart patients really aren't going to be recognized for decades as far as what the outcomes will be. <laughs> so the late outcomes in the adults that we are taking care of reflect a different era. However, we have a unique opportunity because the lessons that we can learn from late follow-up can be extremely important to guide our current therapies. So with tetralogy, we see that they have changed the paradigm. And that is, when Jimmy was a child, the early strategies were just to take out all the pulmonary stenosis. And to do that, surgeons usually did a transannular patch with a large ventriculotomy or an extensive myomectomy. And that was done because pulmonary regurgitation was basically felt like it was a benign lesion. If you have to have one valve leak, the pulmonary valve's probably the valve. You remember that survival curve. All those children did well. However, now that we recognize the long-term complications, more recent surgical strategies focus on preserving the integrity of the pulmonary valve and accepting a tolerable amount of residual PS or right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. <clears throat> 
And no matter how you do, we know that both ends of the spectrum are, are going to result in some hemodynamic impairment. That is, we have to emphasize that when you're operated on as a child, you're not cured. You still have residual. And there's this balance of trying to figure out how much pulmonary stenosis, right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, versus how much PR is acceptable. And this has contributed to why surgical techni techniques have changed over time. This figure is just showing you some data from the group in Belgium, and you can see the transannular patch is in the dark blue, and in the 1990s, that was the predominant surgery, but look more recently how surgeries have changed so that now the lighter blues, valve sparing techniques or infundibulum sparing techniques are much more utilized. So there is a host of complications that we see in our adults with tetralogy, and I've listed them there here. Many of them are directly cardiac related. That is, we've spoken about pulmonary regurgitation. As the right ventricle dilates, you can also get tricuspid regurgitation, or you may get tricuspid regurgitation because the initial surgery used part of the tricuspid valve in order to close the VSD. The right ventricle dilates, it often becomes dysfunctional. You can have varying degrees of residual right ventricular outflow tract obstruction that leads also into the branch PAs, aortic root dilation, LV dysfunction, and then a host of arrhythmias, both atrial and ventricular, and sadly, sudden cardiac death, which is rare, but happens about 3% per decade in this specific group of patients. So let's look at some data on patients with tetralogy. This is data of 550 patients at 11 North American centers that we were able to collect through the ARC group. And we um, looked at the chance of arrhythmias. The atrial arrhythmias are shown in shades of blue, green, and orange. That's atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, or intraatrial reentrant tachycardia. Ventricular arrhythmias are shown in red. And you can see that in the fourth decade is when patients really start to increase in their prevalence of having an arrhythmia. There's a lot of residual anatomic disease that can come up. Here's some gadolinium enhanced MRAs. This is a patient who has proximal right pulmonary artery stenosis. You can see that narrowed proximal right PA there. Now that may have been original disease or it may have been a result of previously having a Blalock toxic shunt put there and at the time of its release that wasn't adequately addressed. This was a younger patient, a teenager, who had evidence of something on echo that we couldn't see really well in the right ventricular outflow tract. And as this spins around, you'll see she has a huge right ventricular outflow tract aneurysm here. We think a lot about ventricular dysfunction in the group of patients with tetralogy. This is data from that same group, the ARC group, 550 patients from 11 centers, looking at echocardiographic data. And what we realized was that at least 20% of those adults with tetralogy have some degree of left ventricular dysfunction. And more than that, when you look at diastolic dysfunction, Jamil Abelhausen and colleagues were able to show that diastolic dysfunction relates to the frequency of ventricular arrhythmia. As you can see here, left ventricle diastolic dysfunction in blue, right ventricular diastolic dysfunction in red. And those with diastolic dysfunction had higher frequency of having ventricular tachycardia. So we're starting to better understand heart failure in the congenital heart disease patient, which has some similarities to heart failure in the non-congenital heart disease patient, but may have some unique aspects as well. This first diagram is from the European Society of Cardiology recommendations on treatment of right heart failure. And I like it because I think it illustrates well what happens many times in tetralogy. The normal heart changes such that when the RV dilates, you get a real change in that septal position. And with that, you get some compression of the LV. This can be known as the reverse Bernheim effect. And that's a biventricular interaction that's not favorable. Dr. Gava showed this many years ago in Boston when he took 100 patients with tetralogy and looked at MRI data and was able to show the correlation that the lower your right ventricular ejection fraction is, the lower your left ventricular ejection fraction will be. Now more recently, the group in Toronto used echo strain imaging to show that the right ventricular dysfunction is the most important contributor to how the left ventricle works, left ventricular torsion. And that's exciting because we can start thinking about mechanisms of ventricular dysfunction in our patients.
This is some work that we've done with feature tracking by MRI. You can see here you can place points on the myocardium. The arrows are showing you the direction of the myocardial movement. The magnitude of the arrows show you the velocity. And in our group of patients with Tetralogy of Fallot, both impaired right and left ventricular longitudinal strain are highly associated with death or sustained ventricular tachycardia. So we're able to use newer imaging techniques to start to look at mechanisms. Now we're very interested in looking at contemporary outcomes. And about 10 years ago, we started a registry called Indicator, the International Multicenter Tetralogy of Fallot Registry. And we did this because we want to create a large cohort which we can start answering some key questions and look at outcomes. We initially started with four congenital heart centers, our group in Boston, the group at the Royal Brompton in London, the Toronto Center for Adults with Congenital Heart Disease, and the group in Amsterdam. And I want to share with you some of our initial results. The initial 873 patients that we looked at had had a median age of repair of just under three years. And why is that important? It's still probably a little higher than the age of repair we're doing currently for children. And yet, the data that, that we know, for instance, the NOLERT study in Germany, the average age of patients when they were operated on was 12 years old. So we know we don't take care of those patients now as children, so we're trying to get more contemporary data. In order to be in the indicator registry, you had to have a cardiac MRI. And the median follow-up since MRI in these patients was just over four years. We found 32 episodes of either death or sustained ventricular tachycardia, sustained ventricular tachycardia being defined as greater than 30 seconds of VT or requiring an intervention. And what we found was not surprisingly, ventricular dysfunction was associated with the primary outcome, but we also found an interesting finding relating to right ventricular mass. That is, those patients with elevated right ventricular mass or mass to volume ratio had a greater incidence of the outcome. And I just want to share with you our Kaplan-Meier curve looking at this group of patients. This is freedom from outcome of death or sustained ventricular tachycardia. If you're a patient with repaired tetralogy and you have none of the identifiable risk factors, you do very well. In fact, your survival over 10 years is 98%. However, just having one risk factor, and the one that came out the strongest was that elevated RV mass to volume ratio, your chance of survival or freedom from VT drops to 86%. If you have two risk factors, and here we're going to add decreased left ventricular function, you drop to 74%. And then if you add other clinical factors, such as atrial tachyarrhythmias, very poor, 43% freedom from outcome over the time frame. So one of the questions that immediately came up about this new finding of elevated right ventricular mass was, well, is this just a surrogate for right ventricular pressure elevation? So we were able to look at over 300 patients who had echocardiographic data very closely related to their MRI time, and we found that RV hypertension and elevated mass were really independently associated with poor outcomes. I just want to show you one example of one of the patients in our registry locally who died. This man died of heart failure at 66 years of age. And just take a look at his MRI pictures where you can see again in this short axis view, as you come into the mid ventricle, you can see this very elevated right ventricular mass. The mass to volume ratio here, 0.34. He also has significant ventricular dysfunction with a right ventricular ejection fraction of 27, left ventricular ejection fraction of 42. And on autopsy, you can see he had a great deal of fibrosis. Now the exciting thing about working with other centers and getting large numbers for the first time for us, we're able to do other studies, answer other questions. So Rachel Wald in Toronto had a very important question. She wanted to know, can we identify by MRI predictors of RV failure in tetralogy patients? We've got this large group of patients, let's take a look. She looked at 849 MRI studies in 339 patients. These are young adults. Average age of their first MRI was 23 years. And she defined disease progression. That is, between the two MRIs, you had disease progression if your right ventricular end diastolic volume index increased by at least 30 milliliters per meter squared. That's quite significant clinically, or it had a decrease in ventricular ejection fraction on either side of at least 10%. And what she found was in this large group that disease progression occurred in 15% of the cohort. However, surprisingly, there was no significant differences that we could find between any demographic, EKG, exercise, or CMR parameters to predict which patients were suddenly going to have worse numbers. 
One thing she was able to find was to figure out how often we should be doing MRIs in these patients. This is a common question that comes up. So in the guidelines, the multimodality guidelines for scanning patients with tetralogy, we said, why don't we do it every three years? That was not based on a lot of data at that time it was published, but this study came out a couple of years later, which thankfully did find that three years seemed to be the best sensitivity and, se and specificity you'll get for detecting disease progression. This graphic is showing you change in RV diastolic volume and ejection fraction of the RV in red, the LV in green. So currently our practice is to repeat cardiac MRI in adults with repaired tetralogy every three years as long as they haven't had any other significant clinical change that you can detect. But there are many other questions in our tetralogy patients that remain unanswered. And one of the biggest ones is, in a patient like Jimmy who presents with heart failure and arrhythmias and severe pulmonary regurgitation, is it helpful, is it useful to replace the pulmonary valve? And if we do that, when should we do that? So what do we know? We know that compared to patients without a pulmonary valve with tetralogy, once you put in a pulmonary valve, subjectively, patients usually feel better. Their QR restoration may decrease slightly or it may not change. Objective exercise testing does not usually change. But you will get a significant decrease in the RV volumes, 30 to 40%. The ejection fraction of the right ventricle usually does not improve, and the left ventricular volume may increase slightly as you've changed that ventricular interaction, but the ejection fraction may get a little better or it may not. The good news is that the 30-day mortality for the operative procedure is very low, and now we're doing more and more percutaneous pulmonary valves as well with low core morbidities. But what are we doing it for? And as a field, we have not been able to yet prove that putting a pulmonary valve in a patient and a tetralogy patient alters their risk of dying or having a sustained ventricular arrhythmia. This was a study done several years ago. It's a case control study matching patients with tetralogy to their age and QR restoration for those that have had a pulmonary valve and those that have not. And you can see that there was no significant difference between the two groups as it relates to these hard outcomes. So our traditional approach to putting in a pulmonary valve in patients with tetralogy is really based on symptoms or arrhythmias or patients who present with ventricular dysfunction. Historically, by x-ray, if you saw an increased cardiothoracic ratio, again, signs of ventricular dilation, you would think about it. A wider QR restoration, because there has been data now for several decades that a QR restoration greater than 180 milliseconds is more associated with sudden death in these patients but basically using a lot of qualitative measures of RV size. And I think we have to start asking ourselves, what is our goal post-PVR? Because much of the research that has been done to think about the optimal timing to put a pulmonary valve in a tetralogy patient is based on a number that will then give you a normalized right ventricular volume following the procedure. But we know that even if you normalize your volume, that doesn't last forever. Six or seven years out, patients start to increase their volume again. So more recent investigations are now using more quantitative measurements of ventricular functions, symptoms, trying to objectively classify exercise and arrhythmias. So this is one of the common questions that we get asked, so I just wanted to share with you six studies looking at the different volumes of the right ventricle that authors have advocated to think about replacing a pulmonary valve, and that's in an asymptomatic patient with tetralogy. Basically, somewhere once the volume of the right ventricle gets above 150 or 160 milliliters per meter squared for diastolic volume or above 85 for systolic volume, we start to consider it. So I have developed this algorithm myself to think about how to care for patients with repaired tetralogy who have significant pulmonary regurgitation. And that is if they're symptomatic, then really they just need one of the markers uh, by imaging or other exercise markers as well. If they have no symptoms, we think a lot about these specific numbers and we also are starting to think more about the contributions of elevated RV mass, elevated RV pressures. So when we think about Jimmy and how successful he was in 1967, patients with tetralogy today don't stay in the hospital three weeks. But he did well until he presented decades later with heart failure. And we tried medical management, it was not successful, so we actually sent him for a pulmonary valve replacement in 2008. At the time, the surgeon also did a right ventricular outflow tract cryoablation and a maze procedure for his history of arrhythmias. Uh, 
After that, he developed sinus node dysfunction, and he's a DJ. He moves around a lot, and he was just really tired. So we put in a permanent pacemaker in 2011. Unfortunately, the next year, he developed recurrent atrial flutter, came back and had a successful ablation, and then he did very well for several years until last year when his ejection fraction of both the right and the left ventricle decreased. Right ventricle ejection fraction went to 30%, left ventricle went to 45 So we upgraded him to CRT therapy. I would tell you there is absolutely no data in our patients on when to do that, but we give it a try. It has not made great strides in him, so we have now referred him to our advanced heart failure team for transplant consideration. So I wanted to spend time on his case because he is someone who we see in the clinic and has many of the complications that we see. For the remainder of our time, I just want to focus on two other adult congenital heart disease conditions that you may see. And the first is transposition of the great arteries. Transposition of the great arteries is a physiology that is two circuits in parallel rather than in series. And you can see in this illustration here, the great arteries arise from the opposite sides of the interventricular septum than is normal. And this is not compatible with life. So you need some mixing when you're born, either at the atrial level by an ASD, at the ventricular level by a VSD, or at the great artery level by a PDA. And similar to patients with tetralogy, there's been a great evolution of surgical repairs for patients with transposition. And this is critically important when you take care of an adult with transposition is to understand the surgical error they were operated in. So I just have three illustrations here to go through with you. The first is the traditional surgery, started, pioneered in the late 1950s, early 1960s, which is called the atrial switch procedure. When you see these patients, they have a mustard or a senning procedure. And you can see what the surgeon has done is beautifully rerouted the blue blood from the SVC and the IVC over to the left ventricle in order to get it successfully to the lungs. So when it comes back into the heart, now it's the red blood, this is the pulmonary venous atrium going down through a tricuspid valve into the right ventricle, which is going to pump out to the body. So this is known as a systemic right ventricle. These type of patients have many different complications than the other types of surgical repair. Less commonly done, but pioneered in the 1970s, is the Rostelli procedure. The Rostelli procedure was specifically done for patients with transposition with pulmonary stenosis and VSD. And you can see here that you have to route the VSD patch to make sure the left ventricle is now committed to the aorta, and you do a right ventricle to PA conduit because there was original pulmonary stenosis. We'll talk about the complications here as well. The reason I bring this up is because many adults that have right ventricle to PA conduits when they are little might be labeled Rostelli procedure, but it's really isolated to this group of patients. Nowadays, the current surgery for transposition is the arterial switch, and these are the young adults that we're seeing, where instead of switching the inflow back in the 60s, now they were able to switch the outflow, and they disarticulate the aorta and the pulmonary roots, move the pulmonary arteries anteriorly, and reanastomose them at the same time, re-implant the coronary arteries. So when you think about the outcomes in these patients, they are very much specified by which surgeon, surgery they have had. So I've li just listed for you here the atrial switch procedure. Because of those baffles that have been developed, they can have obstruction in the baffles, they can have leaks in the baffles, and that right ventricle that has to pump to the body often becomes dysfunctional. <laughs> Tricuspid regurgitation is common, and they may have varying degrees of pulmonary stenosis, which is not always bad, because a little bit of pulmonary stenosis is gonna provide the septum more favorable position and help out the systemic ventricle. These are our patients that are fraught with arrhythmias, and they have a higher incidence of sudden cardiac death than many other adults with congenital heart disease. Now, the more younger patients with arterial switch, it's a beautiful procedure, but they can have problems at the anastomotic sites of moving those roots. Specifically, as you bring the branch PAs forward, the proximal branch PAs can be stretched and stenotic. And then that neoaortic root can become enlarged, become regurgitant. And specifically, there are coronary artery issues that come up when you move coronary arteries as a child. We really have no idea all of the issues that come up with coronary anatomy, but small studies show us that there's tremendous vascular abnormalities in those coronaries. The specific group of patients that have had a Rostelli procedure, it's a very intricate procedure, and you can see by the diagram, you have to make sure they don't have subaortic stenosis, mm -hmm. 
Those conduits don't grow with children, so oftentimes they need to be replaced. They can become regurgitant and ventricular dysfunction also common. So this is just an example of one of our older patients who's had an atrial switch procedure. This woman had a mustard procedure. You can see here, these are again short axis images at the base of the heart, a very dilated, hypertrophied right ventricle compared to the left ventricle. And this is just an example of the systemic right ventricle. As a field, we're still working on the best therapies when this ventricle starts to fail. Traditional heart failure therapies haven't been proven to help. We can also look at baffle leaks, and this is where MRI is particularly helpful as adults oftentimes have limited echo windows when they've had multiple surgeries. So here, just to orient you, here's the right ventricle. You can see it's hypertrophied, pumping out the aorta. Here's the tricuspid valve here. This is the pulmonary venous atrium that receives the red blood, and here's the back of the pulmonary venous atrium. And then this systemic venous atrium you can see coming up from the liver is sandwiched in between. You can get a hint that there's a leak there, but we can use phase contrast imaging. This is called in-plane flow to actually look at the direction of flow here. This is just like color Doppler. What you're seeing is the flow is going from the pulmonary venous atrium, the red flow, back to the systemic venous atrium. So it's acting like an ASD. The younger group of patients are those now that have had an arterial switch, and I just wanted to show you a couple examples. This is a gadolinium MRA. Here's the branch PAs draped over that ascending aorta. You can see how a person might get some stenosis there. But the nice thing about this procedure is that you now have a systemic left ventricle. However, when you reimplant those coronaries, this is a a uh, respiratory navigator gated sequence. Look at this left coronary that's reimplanted. I'll let that play again. It's, it's, it has a very acute angle takeoff as it comes off, and we have to wonder what type of vascular abnormalities could exist there or in the right coronary there. <clears throat> So in the last several minutes, I just wanted to touch on those patients with aortic coarctation. Again, a group of patients that you will see. There are many different types of surgeries that could have taken place for an adult with coarctation. I've just listed some here. Traditional surgery was the subclavian flap repair. So this illustration is showing you a discrete coarctation in the proximal portion of the descending aorta. So you can imagine if you took the left subclavian artery and just flapped it down, you then create a better passageway. This is not routinely done anymore. Older patients may have had bypass conduits that just put in from the area before the obstruction to after the obstruction, but more recent surgical techniques involve just an end-to-end -end anastomosis where the surgeon will cut out that area of coarctation and put the two parts of the aorta together. Now, many patients with aortic coarctation don't follow the book. They don't look exactly like this and have a discrete narrowing. In fact, their transverse aorta can be very narrowed. They may need an extended end-to-end -end augmentation. Patch augmentations with Dacron were done routinely in the 1970s and early 80s. However, we've learned that's associated with a high incidence of aneurysmal formation, so we no longer do that. Very rarely, patients can have balloon dilation or stenting as a primary repair for coarctation, but many of our adults come back for recoarctation and have this performed. I wanted to talk about this for just a few minutes because in the Adult Congenital Heart Disease Guidelines published in 2008, they recommend that adults with coarctation are seen annually and that they have cross-sectional imaging at least every five years to look for some of these complications. So I've listed some of the associations here. This is just a still frame angiogram showing you a recurrent coarctation in a patient. Here's some post-stenotic dilation of the descending aorta. So when we image these patients, we look for the complications of arch obstructions or aneurysms. We know that 50% of patients are going to have a bicuspid or bicommissural aortic valve, which often is associated with ascending aortic dilation. So a mistake we can make is just to look at the descending aorta and forget about the ascending aorta. Whenever you have a patient with any left-sided obstructive lesion, you want to look for more. So we look for mitral stenosis, aortic stenosis. We think about the effects on the ventricle and how left ventricular hypertrophy is important as a prognostic marker in these patients. Many go on and develop systemic hypertension. There is data to show that they have early incidence of coronary artery disease, and 10% of patients with coarctation have cerebral aneurysms, and those guidelines actually recommend that an adult with a coarctation should have their brain imaged at least once in their lifetime. <clears throat> this is just an example of someone who had had a recurrent coarctation. You can see the MRA here just showing a very unusual proximal descending aorta. This is a still frame image of a patient who'd had a previous Dacron patch repair of the coarctation that has now become aneurysmal.
And again, an area just open for exploration is about vascular dysfunction in our patients. And the group that we focus on here is coarctation. We know there have been studies showing that patients with coarctation have abnormal endothelial function. They have increased arterial stiffness. You can have a patient come back with no imaging or catheter findings of a recurrent coarctation that is still has very significant hypertension. And Eric Krieger, several years ago, looked at a group of patients with repaired coarctation by MRI and exercise testing and found that up to a third of patients had a hypertensive response to exercise. Those are those patients here. And that means that the, when they exercise, their blood pressure, their systolic blood pressure went to 220 or greater. And it was those patients that definitely had an increased left ventricular mass to volume ratio. And he was able to correlate that increased left ventricular mass with greater disease of systemic hypertension as well. So starting to think about not just the actual lesion, but the downstream effects on the heart and other systems. So it's there that I want to conclude and leave time for questions. Just to emphasize, the number of adults with congenital heart disease continues to grow. And these adults are at risk for many long-term complications. But many of the specific cardiac complications are based directly on the surgical era. And I think there's multiple areas of research here. The link between the vasculature and long-term outcomes in our patients needs much more, much more investigation. I want to thank all the people I work with in Boston and specifically all the people that collaborate on the Indicator Project with us. Happy to take some questions. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Anne-Marie. That was an uh, outstanding, uh, outstanding lecture. A um, couple things before we get to questions. Uh, everybody that's here, there's surveys in the back. Please, please fill out these surveys. These are important to uh, continue to maintain CME accreditation. Uh, and also, for the questions, make sure you use a microphone uh, because this is being recorded. And also, you can go to the uh, uh, DICE at YouTube website starting next week, and you can watch this uh, lecture and follow-up. Okay, so let me start off with Wayne here. Go ahead. Henry, thanks for an excellent talk. You really summarized a lot of important data. I want to ask you a question about something that you didn't talk about, but I know you're, you lecture on and that you're involved with is pregnancy. Um, what do you guys do in Boston for your, your adult congenital patients who want to become pregnant as far as counseling, imaging, preconception testing, things like that? Thanks very much, Dr. Franklin. It's a terrific question, and it's something that we continually are working on because many of the opportunities to counsel women about pregnancy when they're younger are missed, and they show up actually pregnant. So it's an entirely different discussion if someone shows up pregnant with congenital heart disease or if you have the opportunity to thoughtfully think ahead of time with them about best options. So we have a very close collaboration with our maternal fetal medicine group, and what we recommend is that women often with their partners go and meet with our high-risk obstetrician ahead of time to talk about some of the expectations for pregnancy. So what are the expectations? The expectations are that you have to have a good functional class, number one. If you're not exercising, you need to exercise. And we're actually doing a study in that right now in our pregnant women. If you don't have a normal ventricular function, you're strongly counseled um, to consider the, the real morbidities and mortality of pregnancy. If you have significant obstructive lesions, we try to optimize patients before they actually get pregnant. And then um, the other part is just the expectation of what to expect in pregnancy as far as we have a specific protocol that when women are pregnant they do go through as far as how many visits they're seen based on their level of risk, what type of testing is done, and then their delivery plan. We come up with the anesthesia and the obstetricians a plan for what monitoring is needed and how long women need to be monitored. It's not a perfect system. We're constantly changing that. I would say, that, again, it's, a, it's an area where the more collaboration we can do to look at these patients, um, the better. But it's a, it's a growing group of women, women that traditionally were told not to get pregnant are getting pregnant every day now. To uh, shift a little bit, uh, I would assume that the FAA wouldn't let anybody, uh, any one of these people become a commercial pilot. But what about the various jurisdictions? What do you do with these people with getting a driver's license? Uh, is it different in, in England and the Netherlands than here? And what about the various states? Uh, what, what happens to these people in the real world? Oh, that's a terrific question. I'm not sure I know the answer to some of the European 
centers, um, how they stratify patients with regard to driving. I would tell you that we follow the guidelines for arrhythmias, um, patients that have had syncope and, and those sorts of things are not allowed to drive for certain periods of time. But other than that, it, it is difficult to actually forbid someone from driving. They don't usually ask us to tell you the truth. What we get asked about is occasionally um, wanting to have a captain's license on a boat or things like that, which again, um, you know, is problematic. But I think that, that most patients do really well day to day. The risk of sudden events is low. The problem with our field is that we can't tell which people are gonna have the sudden events. Um, well, I've, I think it's individualized, and I think that many of us take the, the role of we are going to counsel people with what we know, ask them to make smart decisions about their lives, but I can't control, nor do I think it's my, my right to control their ultimate decision on, on some of their lifestyle practices. Thank you for coming. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, can you address the valve replacement in a TET, meaning uh, how does it behave compared to left-sided? And do you go bioprosthesis or mechanical? And uh, maybe the newer percutaneous valve, are they functioning as well? I know we don't have as much data, but yes. so far, are they functioning as well as the surgical valve? Uh, thank you, Dr. Zogby. The reason I included the discussion about pulmonary valve replacement in tetralogy patients, it is really the most common question we get asked. So the, the historical perspective is that tissue valves in the pulmonary position do very well. And, um, and patients can do well, and we have patients that we followed for decades with tissue valves. However, um, there's recent data showing that some certain um, conformations of tissue valves do not fare as well and have a higher degree of having leaflet dysfunction uh, and calcification. And so it's an area that we're having to look at more actively. Uh, the, the pulmonary valve replacement by catheters has been a great, great um, advancement in our field. And whereas the trials started now, you know, a decade and a half ago with very individualized patients that had a certain size conduit, they're now being applied for various patients with different types of outflow tracts. I think that the data is still largely unknown as to their durability. Questions and concerns that have come up, although patients function very well with them, is that there's a high incidence of stent fracture because these valves are usually implanted on a stent, and that um, there is there does seem to be a, a higher prevalence of endocarditis in these patients, and that's something that now there's several publications, and we have to counsel people very strongly about if they've had previous endocarditis, a percutaneous valve may not be for them. If they have a percutaneous valve, they really need to be vigilant about um, preventing endocarditis. And we have several interventionalists in the audience, such as Dr. Lin, that may be able to add something to that, who puts in these valves. But I think, you know, it's a, it's, it's a great advancement for the field, and yet we always have to think about, they seem to look good now, but how are they going to look 10, 20 years from now? Because pulmonary valve surgery is still a very low-risk surgery with very good results. Terrific uh, talk. Thank you for coming. Um, this is a curiosity question with a little bit of pathophysiology. So, when a child gets the atrial switch, or mm -hmm. mustards, we convert them to the same physiology as a child being born with corrected transposition. Basically, now they have a systemic RV. So as we look at the long-term course of these patients, how does the one that we created compares to the one that was born with that physiology as they become adults? Do they track about the same? Because we also see people with corrected transposition that now are adults having RV failure also. So how do the two kind of compare with each other? Yeah. So the, this question of do all patients with systemic right ventricles have the same complications long term is an excellent question. And the problem with it is that much of the data, people do lump the two together. And it's completely different whether you're born as a child and undergo a surgery that puts in a rigid atrial baffle. So for instance, when you want to increase your capacity to exercise, sometimes those baffles can't do that. You cannot increase your stroke volume. Whereas being born with a systemic right ventricle, but having a left ventricle that pumps to the pulmonary artery circuit that's placed on the right side is a different physiology. And the problem with our field is because the numbers have been traditionally so small at single centers, we just put everybody together. But I do think there are some things that are coming to light. One of them is that when you're born with the 
congenitally corrected transposition, and you've never had surgery, your prognosis is going to be highly dependent on any associated lesions. So if all you have is the corrected transposition and everything else is good, you're okay. We're going to talk more about this at noon conference for the fellows that are able to join us. But I'll tell you, if you have associated defects, and the largest one is a dysplastic tricuspid valve, which many people have, and tricuspid regurgitation, you're at real risk for right ventricular failure. And there's data now out of the Mayo Clinic that shows that once that tricuspid regurgitation gets beyond a mild amount, you need to act on that systemic right ventricle because if you don't, you're going to run into real problems when you try to fix it later and these are people that have worse outcomes. So I think it's a, it's a very thoughtful question. I don't have the, the, the whole answer, but i really into working with multiple centers to get more patients so we can look at things individually. Yeah. That was a really fantastic talk. Um, I guess I want to take a step back and think about sort of 30,000 foot look. I mean, your graph at the beginning showing that we're going to get 2.3 million adults with congenital heart disease in the United States alone, that's kind of staggering. And you and I know how bad it can be when they show up in the middle of the night. I guess the question is, are all of them going to be like that? If that's the case, what kind of burden on the healthcare system and what do we need to do for the general cardiologists? I mean, do we need to start talking about fellowship programs, training a lot more adult congenital heart disease? Because not everybody can be a specific practitioner in adult congenital heart disease. Right. Right. Thank you, Dr. Lin. And, and it, it's the thing that we think a lot about every day. I think there are several ways to approach it. Number one, these patients are their best own advocates. Many of these young adults are empowered to know a lot about their health, and we need to encourage that so that when they come in, they're not dependent on their mother or their father to give a history when they're 35 years old. And when they come in, the most common things they present with, I think, are heart failure-related complications and arrhythmias. And although we may not always have colleagues that know the intricate details of the four or five interventions that they've had, they can start by consultation with us to create a system where we're able to co-manage patients. And I think that's what it comes down to. I would love to train every adult cardiology fellow for months in adult congenital heart disease. But right now, that's just not possible. And I think that just having some exposure for our practice, what we do, our fellows do a month with us. And we say, we just want you to end the month and know what you think you can handle and what you need to refer. And know that the reason that people like you and Wayne and other people in the audience exist is that because we should know the answers because that's what we do. Um, so I think that the two-part answer is that the patients are somewhat advocates for themselves and that just by co-managing patients uh, with with very, very good cardiologists. And you know, I think it's a, a delicate balance to not make people think they can't do it at all because everybody's gonna have to do it. Um, and these are fun patients to take care of. I mean, they do really well most of the time. And when they do get sick, we can oftentimes make them feel a whole lot better. Okay. Miguel? Patients with uh, transposition and the uh, atrial switch. Every now and then they will have atrial flutters and we may need to go in there and do a reverse transeptal puncture and go through the baffle. And you show a picture of an MRI with, uh, with shunt through that baffle. Now, when I've done these, I've never thought about the consequences of doing a transeptal, uh, but should I be worried? Is there any problem? <laughs> have you seen an atrogenic? You first, worry later. <laughs> yeah. Again, this will be just my opinion. I don't think there's long, uh, big-term studies on this, but I would say that when we find shunts, they off, in these patients, in the atrial switch patients, luckily, they often act like ASDs. So if anything, they're gonna load the pulmonary ventricle. And so they may have a little bit of dilation of their left ventricle, but it's not significant. Where we worry about these fenestrations or shunts, sadly, is when you put devices in for good. Because if you put a device in and there's a risk of a thrombus on that device, then there's a risk that that could embolize and, and cause a stroke or something else. So I think it's a different question if you're leaving a lead, but uh, we do transeptals as well, and they oftentimes close, at least we think we do. We do actively investigate for these baffle leaks, but we don't always close them. And one last question, Dr. Ben Rock. Advanced heart failure, guys. So I see the wrath of liver failure, uh, and and I wonder, is there anything to do to use the right-sided pressures as a goal to avoid liver congestion in the context of any innovation with the newer sensors like CardioMAMS have been talked about using that for or invasive testing on a regular basis? Because I I think the liver failure becomes one of the biggest pain at the end. Yes, thank you. So I think this this question of 
how to optimize the right heart to prevent liver failure in mm -hmm. some of these patients is again an area ripe for research. I love the cardiomems. I try to put it in everybody. Most of my patients won't, won't do it. Um, but I think that the more objective information we can get because what I have found in the adult congenital patients is that they have a very, very limited reserve or delicate balance. Whereas one person can go out, eat a meal out, have a salt load, and within a day or two kind of get back to their balance, it may just tip over our patients. So having more objective data like cardiomems or something else can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. We, we Sometimes when we do catheterizations, we feel that's a very static thing. My partner will have people lift weights and do things with their legs and try to bring out exercise for the same reason. We want to get the data in more of a physiologic state than just having someone at rest. So I think especially collaborations with heart failure teams are extremely important because the liver failure that comes up and the liver congestion um, can be really problematic for our patients. Thank you all very much for coming.